to share my screen. So everybody should now be able to see my screen. So this week, we're going to start with all the foundation. These are building blocks. We're going to talk a little bit about what programming is. And we're going to get to the basic things that you have to learn. Variables, types, and a little bit on functions. Because we have to use some functions. We won't write our own functions until week five. But starting in week one, there are functions that we have to use just to get our programs to work. So program flow, input, process, output. It's that simple and it's that difficult. So what is input? It's anything external that's coming into your script. So if I'm sitting in front of a computer and you have submitted a .py file and I am going to run your script and I'm going to type stuff in and expect it to get into that script. That's what input is. Process is what you're doing to the data that came in. You're going to modify it, or you're going to make decisions on what I typed in. That's process. Output is the result of process. So whatever you put in plus what you did to it is what's going to be returned or shown on the screen to a user. So we're also going to start to learn a little teeny bit about flowcharts this week. What's coming up on the screen now is a flowchart. And a flowchart just shows you the logical flow of a program. It is language agnostic, so it's not something you would just do for Python. You would do it for Java. You would do it for C and C++. You would do it for Rust. You would do it for any language. It is a, um, it is a modeling tool used for software. And it's the first modeling tool we learn about in this class. In week three, we're going to be talking more about pseudocode. And so I will do the lab reviews in pseudocode. This week, the lab reviews are going to be in flowcharts. So what is a variable? Well, a variable is a named space in the computer memory. First of all, let me back up a second. Um, there are two resources associated with every computer, and that's space and speed. Speed is how fast is your processor or processors for different things. Um, space is how much data can be stored on a computer, but also um, Space is, the, the concept of space in a program is that when you're running your program, your program's going to go out and it's going to grab chunks of data based on what you've told it it needs to grab. You tell it what it needs to grab by defining variables. So a variable has a scope, and we'll talk about scope starting in uh, module three. Um, it has a name and it has the value. That value is some piece of data stored in the computer memory. So here's a rule. There are going to occasionally be these little rules that come up. Um, variable names have to start with a character. They can't start with a number. They can't start with a special character. And there really aren't very many special characters. You can use an underscore in a, character, in a variable name, and I think that's it. But they always have to start with a character. Okay. The variable names can't include spaces or special characters, just the underscore. Okay. How do I define a variable? Well, you can always tell that it's a variable because it is a word on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. So what I have here is I have the word amount. Amount is a variable name. 
To the right of amount, I have an assignment operator. In this case, it is a single equal sign. And then to the right of that single equal sign is a value. So what happens here is that Python is going to have some storage. It's going to grab some stuff out of the computer memory. And it's going to set up a table. And that table is going to have the name of the variable, which is amount. And then it's going to have, could somebody uh, mute their mics, please? It's going to have a value that's associated with that name. And, and so when you use the word amount, Python will know to get the value 10. Now, I often have students ask, why can't we just use 10? Well, you could. You wouldn't make it a variable. You'd just use that value. But the power of programming comes from the fact that we can change the data, and the process still happens the same way. And if we change the data, which means maybe we're changing 9 to 10, we'd have to reprogram if we actually put the number 10 in our program. I don't want to reprogram, so I'm going to assign the value 10 to a variable named amount. And if someday I assign the value 12 to a variable named amount, I don't have to reprogram anything. I'm just giving it a different value. So that's why variables are important. And they are one of the fundamental building blocks of programming. So let's go out real quick. And by the way, this is PyCharm. PyCharm is what everybody's going to be using to do their projects and to do some of their module two. You're going to have to turn in. Hold on. I'm going to mute people. Okay. Um, Let's see. Yeah, Mert, could you please uh, mute yourself? Mm -hmm. not, I'll... Thank you. So this is PyCharm. PyCharm is the tool that we're going to use when we're not programming in Zybooks. Um, First thing people ask is, how do I, what I always have on module two is a bunch of people saying I couldn't figure out how to get the PY file. So here's how you get the PY file. There are one of two ways. First, you have the module name, which gives you exactly where it is on disk. The other way to do it is to right click. Sorry. There we go. Nope, wrong one. Click the wrong one. If you right click, um, I have a Mac, so it's reveal in Finder, but you would use, if you're on a uh, PC, I think it's like find in folder or something like that, but that's what you would use. And it will take you to the PY file, and the PY file is what you will um, submit next week. So when I go over, the programs, when I, when I go over scripts, I do it in PyCharm. And while we're doing it in PyCharm, I'm going to teach you some interesting little tricks in PyCharm. So we're going to start with, let me just move, remove some of these. We're going to start with a little script I wrote called variables.py. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Come on, there we go. Okay, this is just an example of how to use variables. Now, we, we just saw on the slide about variables, but now I've got this thing called print. Print is a function, and we're going to talk about it a little later. But what print does is it outputs information to the console. So I'm going to go up here, and I have to edit the configuration and tell it what script I want it to run. I want this to run variables. And so there are two ways to run a program. There's this little button up here, this little right arrow. And there's this little thing that looks like a bug. 
The thing that looks like a bug is a debugger, and it allows me to walk through code and see interesting things. So we'll look at that in a minute. Right now, I'm just going to run it. So by the way, this is the console down here, and this just ran, OK? It, my var is 10, print var, and then my var is 12, print my var, and then print 1, 2, 3. So let's now run this through the debugger, because that just kind of happened. So Python is an interpreted and compiled language. You can do either with it. In this state, we are running it as an interpreted language, and that's completely OK. We do not pre-compile the Python code in this class. So everything is running through an interpreter, which means I can easily walk through every single line of code and determine what it is doing. So right now, we know it's a new run. There's nothing in that console except some stuff that PyCharm puts in there. But there is this neat little thing over here called variables. PyCharm has an entire screen just to talk to you about what's in your variables, which tells you how important they are. So if I am running this program, where am I? Well, I have this little red dot. That little red dot is called a breakpoint. The breakpoint says, Python, stop, just stop, right here. Don't execute the line. Stop on it, because I want to see what's going to happen. So when Python is in debug mode, so I've started it with the little bug, and it gets to a line with a red dot, it's going to stop. Now, I love debuggers, because a debugger can show me what's happening in my code. And they're very handy when you are trying to figure out a logic error. So I'm going to step over. Line 3 has not yet been executed. So what do I mean by that? I mean that Python has done what I've asked it to do on line 3. On line 3, what I am asking Python to do is assign the value 10 to a variable named myvar. So I'm going to step over this. So it's Python's going to execute it. The line has now been executed. PyCharm tells me some really cool stuff. Python says right here, this little, this little gray thing at the side, which is, has nothing to do with your, the code that you've typed in. It has to do with what PyCharm is telling you the result of that line of code was. The other thing you can do is look down here. There is a tab called variables. Down here, I have my var equal int, because it's an integer, 10. So this is now something I didn't have before. There was nothing down there. I now have a variable called my var, which has the value 10. So I'm going to step over that line. Now print is just something to put out to the console, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Now I can take my var and set it to 12. So um, if I go back to frames and variables and I step over, now, could everybody mute, please? Um, if I step up, I'm now on line 7. How do I know I'm on line 7? See that blue line? That blue line on line 7 only shows up if I'm in the debugger and I'm stopped on that line. And if the blue line is there, it means I haven't actually done that line yet. So I have the variable myvar. I had previously set it equal to 10. Now I'm going to step over this line, line 7, and if you look under variables, myvar is now going to be 12. So it's the same place in memory. I no longer have a myvar equal to 10. I have a, um, a myvar with um, 12 as its value. And then I'm just going to print myvar. I'm going to print 1, 2, 3, 4. And then I'm going to be done. So that's a little bit about variables. So using a variable. Um, you will have a lot of variables in your program, especially in your game. So what do I have here? I have one, two, three, four, four, three variables, actually. I have total coins is zero, and then I have a nickel count, 
I'm going to have a dime count, and I'm going to have a total coins. Now, nickel count and dime count are inputs, or external inputs, and we'll talk about the input function in a minute. Total coins is just zero at the beginning, so I've defined total coins. I have a variable called nickel count, which is going to be some piece of information I'm going to type in. Um, I have dime count, which is going to be some piece of information I'm going to type in. And I have total coins, which is nickel count plus dime. And then I'm going to output total coins. So that's just, this is just a small encapsulation of how you use different variables. And if you're looking for an associated challenge, the challenge is 1.11.2.py. And I'm not necessarily going to go over it now, but it will be on in the, uh, there will be a link to that in the descriptions. Oh, and I forgot to tell you at the beginning, challenges are not required as part of the partici participation activities. I strongly encourage you to do the challenges because I think they help students understand what's going on, but you are not required to do the challenges. We don't grade them. So if you are running down to crunch time and you're wondering what to do, don't do the challenges. <clears throat> if you are not running down to crunch time and you have time, please do the challenges because I think they're very useful. Which is also why I'm giving you, you know, I have the challenges all um, I have all the challenges for all the modules as part of what goes up on the YouTube site. So we have the assignment operator, which is an equal sign. And we have, we have one, two, three, four, five assignment, four assignment operators. I can't count tonight. And so what you will hear me say for the next couple of weeks is, we know it's a variable because it is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. When you are reading code, that's what you need to do. If you see the word total coin, if you see the word Fred, it doesn't matter. If that word is, if to the right of that word there is a single equal sign, then Fred is a variable name. And whatever is on the right-hand side of that single equal sign becomes its value. So what I'm going to say when I'm talking about this is we know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. So a nickel count. Now, we just showed this in the, uh, the pie charm, but nickel count is nickel count is nickel count. If I have, if I put nickel count 10 times, nickel count is always going to have the same value because it's the same memory space. Just like dime count, dime count is the same way. And then I have total coins which I can print. So when you have a variable and you use that variable name, you give access to the value that, that is contained by that variable. So we have variable types. We have four variable types. We have strings, we have integers, we have floats, and we have booleans. Booleans we're not going to deal with now. They're going to be module three. We have string, integer, and float that we need to deal with today. String is anything surrounded by quotes. That's it. It could be the, it could be the number 42. If it's surrounded by quotes, it's still a string. An integer is just a whole number. It is a number without a decimal place. A float is a number with a decimal place. So those are the three things we're concerned about this week and next. Um, it is important to understand that there are only things that you can do if it's a string and that sometimes the different types don't play well in the sandbox with each other. So we're going to foray into functions for a minute. And the reason we're going to do that is because there are two very important functions that we have to learn to use this week. And Python provides a massive amount of functions. And all a function is, 
is a named block or grouping of Python statements that are meant to do a specific thing. And Python has a boatload of these, and they're all available it just by just having Python installed. So you don't have to worry about writing them. You have to worry about how you use them. So what is a function? And how do I, how do I know what a function is when I'm looking at Python? Well, you will have a name. Function names are very close to variable names when it comes to what's acceptable in terms of characters and what they begin with. But after the, the, the words, you will see an open parenthesis. If you see some words, some underscores maybe, followed by a left parenthesis, or what we also call an open parenthesis, you've pretty much got a function. And then somewhere along the line, there will be a closing parenthesis. So that is what a function is. And when you call a function, it's going to do things. They're programmed out there. Python gives it to you for free. And you just know that it's going to do things. So function name, open parentheses, close parentheses, and sometimes there might be something in the middle, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But when you are looking at a code, that's how you know it's a function. It's a name followed by an open parenthesis and somewhere down the road a closed parenthesis. So why did I always just talk about functions? Well, because sometimes we have to convert one type into another. There are certain things that can only happen with certain types. There are certain things that will only happen with strings. There are certain things that will only happen with integers and float. You can't add two strings together and get like a number. You can't add, you know, Lisa and Fred and get the number 42. It doesn't work that way. You can add 40 and 42 and get the number 42 because they're both integers. So you want to know how to convert a string to an integer, an integer or float to a string, a string to a float. And there are ways to do that. Now, why would you want to do that? And, that's be and I'll show you that when we get to the input statement. But basically, anything that's brought into Python externally is considered a string. So I have string to integer. I have a string. The value of that string is 42. My str is, my str is a variable. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of this, this, that single equal sign is the number 42 in quotes. That means it's a string. It's not the number 42. But I need it to be an integer. So what do I do? Well, I convert it. And how do I convert it? Well, I use a special function called int. So the line that starts with CONV, CONV equal int meister. So we know CONV is a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. To the right-hand side of that single equal sign is this thing we haven't seen before. And it, there's the word int, and then I see that open parenthesis, that left parenthesis. That tells me, okay, int is a function. It's going to do something. And before we get to the closing parenthesis, in this case, we have something in the middle. And what's in the middle is a variable name. The variable name here is Meister. We can go back and look at the value of Meister by going back to the Meister line and seeing that it is 42 in quotes. So when I'm done, what CONV will be is 42 without quotes. So I can use it in, in, in arithmetic expressions. Same thing with string to float. Okay? I have my str. I know my str is a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. So the right-hand side of a single equal sign is 3.14 in quotes. So it's a string. Now I want to convert it to a float because let's say I want to do some arithmetic operations on it. I can now use the float function. So in this case, we have the variable name CONV 
equal float left parenthesis, which means float is a function. Before the closing of that parenthesis, there is the variable myster, which is what's the string that's going to be converted to a float. And I can also go back. I can say my int, if my int is 42, I can convert it to a string, which puts it in quotes. And that works for an integer or a float. Okay. So input and output. Input and output, well, input and print are functions. We know they're functions because they have that beautiful left parenthesis. What do they do? Input takes external input and brings it into your program. What in the world do I mean by external input? There are all kinds of external inputs for a computer. There's keyboard, there's mouse, there's joysticks, there's game consoles. All of those are input devices. So they bring information into the computer and what we're going to do is we're going to bring information into our Python script. Print is the ability to output to the computer screen. So um, you will actually see a message on your screen or when we're doing this in PyCharm. So I'm going to stop here for a second and we're going to do simple input and output. Okay. So simple input. So let me change this to simple input. Simple input. So what's happening? Well, I just have this my var equal input input something, and then I'm going to print it out. So my var is a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of that single equal sign is the word input. Input is followed by an opening parenthesis. There's something in the middle, and it closes the parenthesis. So input is a function. So now I'm going to debug. So here I am in the debugger again. It has stopped on line four. It has not yet executed line four. If I go into variables, I can see I do not have a variable named myvar. If I go to the console, kind of nothing there. So why is the console important? Because when you're running a program in PyCharm and you have an input, it's going to wait until you have input something on the console and hit the enter key. So when I step over line four, and by the way, this is step over, that little thing that's a bent arrow, will allow me to move to the next line of code. So I'm going to move to the next line of code, and you will see all the blue went away. The blue went away because it's waiting on input from me. You will see down here that on the console, the words input something showed up. So I'm going to input 42. So when I hit the enter key, I now have a blue line again because I've completed what I'm supposed to do as the user. I'm supposed to enter information. So I'm back inside the script. Now you will also see here that I have variables. I have my var equals stir 42. Anytime you are using the input function and you are Entering something from the console, it will always come in as a string. Everything has to be converted from a string. Right now, if you want it to be used as an integer, you'd use it as an int. You'd have to use the int function. If you wanted to use it as a float, you'd have to use the float function. Because everything is a string. So now I'm going to print my var. Print is how I get stuff out to the console. So input is goes into print is goes out of. So if I step let's go back to the console. If I step over line seven, two things are going to happen. It's going to output 42 and it's going to stop the program because there are no more lines. 
So that's what input and output is. Okay, so we're going to um, just run through a couple of things on how to call the input function. So this is challenge 1.3.4, and I said, read two numbers from user input, then print the sum of those numbers. So I'm going to ask the user for two things, and when they've given them to me, I'm going to turn them into integers, and then I'm going to add them together. So on the right-hand side of this screen, you will see a small float chart, because I just want to get you guys thinking about what a flow chart looks like because you're going to have to do them later on in the course. Okay, so I have a variable. My variable name is num1. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. The right-hand side of a single equal sign is the word int. I have an open parenthesis, so int is a function. Inside of that, I have input, the word input. There is a left parenthesis directly after the word input, which means I have another function. I have two closing parentheses, so everything is closed because your parentheses have to be balanced. So what I have on that line is num1 is going to equal the input value that has been converted to an integer. That's what that line tells me. and close parentheses. So if your handy dandy Professor Lisa is sitting there and she's going to put in the number two, that's input. So when I have the input or the output, I'm going to have that weird little parallelogram in my flowchart. So now I have num2. Same thing, num2 is a variable, it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign, on the right-hand side is the function int, inside the function int is the function call to input. And I'm going to print, I'm going to input 4, so I've entered 2 and I've entered 4. Both of them are inputs, now I have process. Process is what am I going to do with those, this information? Well, I'm going to print num1 plus num2. Now I can do an arithmetic expression because at the same time that they're being assigned, they're being converted to an integer. So num1 is 2, num2 is 4. The sum, that's my process, the sum is going to be output to the screen and it's going to be 6. So that is how we're going to call the input function. So don't be surprised in Zybooks if you see something like this. If you see int open parenthesis input open and close parenthesis and another close parenthesis, then you're seeing the use of the input statement. And there's one thing that's important to remember about Zybooks. Um, Zybooks, is, you're going to do your test when you're creating it using some amount of data that they supply. When you go to submit it, they're going to add a bunch of different kinds of data in. So you may, you may be testing your code with 2 and 4 for num1 and num2, but when you actually go to run it through all of the tests, they may use 4 and 6 or 7 and 3, so those numbers are going to change. Those values are going to change. And that's important because some students start off and instead of, you know, doing int input, they're just going to type the number 42 in there, and then they don't know why their program doesn't pass the test. So you have to define your variables and you have to understand where those variables are getting set. Okay, sorry, and now we have the end for the, this little script. Um, you can't rule, you can use one function to call inside of another. For every open parenthesis, there must be a closed parenthesis, so the parentheses have to be balanced. Okay. 
Print can be a string, integer, float, or Boolean variables. However, if a string if a string is a string, then all integers, floats, and Boolean have to be converted to string. So if it's a string, you have to convert in the print statement. Okay. So this is just how to call the print function. The function name is print. We have an open parenthesis. We have some number of arguments, and we have a closed parenthesis. And that's how you call print. Print will also automatically give you a new line. There are ways to stop that, and we will see what the ways to stop that are. Okay, so your print function can have one argument or two, or two arguments, or a couple of arguments, actually. In this case, the name of the function call is still print. I have two arguments separated by a comma. I have the words line one, comma, and then I have this end equal quote space quote. What in the world does that do? The second argument, this special end equal whatever, right now it's quote space quote, um, tells Python don't put a new line after it. Don't hit the return key. Instead, put a space after it or put what's ever in those quotes after it. And then you can always go back and print another line with a new line in it. So in this case, we're going to have line one. And my little things are off. My apologies. And then continued. And my boxes are off. I apologize. Again, for every open parenthesis, you have to have a closed parenthesis. Print ends in a new line unless you tell it not to. All arguments are comma separated. And the end with two quotes tells Python to not add a new line, but instead add a space. Now, why am I harping on this? That's because you're going to have to use that in labs this week. Okay, secret life of a Python script. This is, I can't remember which challenge this is. I should have put it on the slide. Um, the following program calculates yearly and monthly salary given an hourly wage. The program assumes work uh, that a standard work week is 40 hours. And uh, so here we're going to have our start again because we're going to do our low flow chart. I am going to have a variable called hourly wage. I know it's a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of a single equal sign is the word int followed by an open parenthesis, which tells me int is a function. And it is one of the functions that we call to convert values. To the right of that open parenthesis, I see the word input. Input is followed directly by another open parenthesis. Input is a function call. Input does not take any arguments in this case, so it will be open and closed, no big deal, and then you're going to close out the int. So I'm inputting the number 20, and that's going to be my hourly wage. I'm now going to say process. My process is yearly equal hourly times 40 times 50. So this is how much I'm going to make. So it's yearly is going to be 20 times 40 times 50, which is 40,000. And monthly, how much am I making a month is going to be hourly, and hourly is, has the value of 20 times 40 times 4. So that's $3,200. And I'm going to output annual salary is yearly, and monthly salary is 32,000. And then we end. Statements and expressions. I'm going to try and get, get through all of the slides, including the uh, review of the labs. And then I'll open it up to questions. Statements and expressions. Um, this is kind of flavor versus function. A statement is something with an assignment operator, basically. So these are all statements. 
please enter an integer, please enter, an, you know, x equal input, y equals input. Those are statements. Process are usually an expression. They do something with the data. They modify it. Output is pretty much a statement. And then we end. So that's all I'm going to say about statements and expressions. You don't necessarily have to know the nuances. You just have to know that, um, yeah, I, I just introduced this topic because iBooks talks about it. Okay, cases and spaces matter. Python is a case-sensitive, space-delimited language. And what that means is that a lowercase x is not the same as an uppercase x. Just isn't. Python considers them two completely different things. Why is that? It has to do with something called the ASCII table. We won't necessarily go into that. If you really want to, me to answer that question after class, I'd be happy to. So case sensitivity. Little x is not the same as big X. Big D is not the link same as little b. Um, space delimited. Space delimited means that you have to have your code spaced correctly, aligned correctly. And um, so here I have the variable x. I'm assigning the value 2 to it. I have the value y. I'm assigning the variable. Sorry, I have the variable y and I'm assigning the value 4 to it. And you will see those are on two separate lines, and they are both left justified. To the right of that, I have the exact same stuff, except to put them on one line. The stuff on one line is a syntax error, because Python doesn't know when things end. So Python knows, so there's a couple ways that Python knows this statement ends. One of them is that there is a space. Sorry, there is a new line. A space won't cut it. The other way is, and this is for if statements, function definitions, things like that, is a colon. Okay. So not all characters are visible. And this is just a general um, discussion. Every character that is represented on a computer has a numerical equivalent and a hexadecimal equivalent. Um, but some of the spaces, some of the characters we're going to use are still characters, but they're not necessarily visible. Space, tab, and new line are all invisible characters. Maybe space, maybe you could argue that space was or wasn't, but tab and new line, excuse me, do not have, well, tab and new line are definitely considered non-visible characters. And then we have some special, goodness, I can't spell. I don't know how long that's been there because I've used this slide a lot. Okay, let's go back now that I... So there are special characters and those special characters have to be what we call is escaped. Escaping a character means to tell Python to use it only as a character and not as a programming reference. For instance, if I have two double quotes and a quote inside of that, Python's not going to go what, know what to do. It's going to say, I beg your pardon, I don't know what to do, like the one with double quote here. So what I do is I escape. I put a backslash in front of, which is also called escaping, the double quote that's going to mess things up. And then I can come out with the statement that I want to come out with. So there are certain characters like slash n, which is a new line, that I can put inside of a string and it will in fact put a new line between two things. It'll be like hitting the enter key and that's under the new line example. So we also have arithmetic operators. There's just a touch on these, plus, minus, multiplication, division, and, mod and exponent. Um, so 
those are the basics. We're going to talk about a few more later on, but if you know these from another language or if you know these from just general mathematics, that's what they are. The only difference is that an exponent is just a star star instead of like a, a 2 as a superscript. Okay, lab 1.9. So now we're going to get started on the labs and I'm going to walk through each and every one of these labs. This week and next week I will be using flowcharts. From that point on I will be using, uh, from 3 on I will be using pseudocode. We don't really get into pseudocode much until then, so I'm just going to stick with flowcharts. So lab 1.9. So I'm going to complete the program to read four values from input. Well, what does four values from input mean? It means I'm going to have four input calls in my script. And store values in variables, first name, generic location, home number, and plural noun. So in this case, Zybooks has given us the name of the variables to use. So I'm going to input four values into four variables and I'm going to output a short story. So I have start. I'm going to input first name. I'm going to input generic location. I'm going to input whole number. And I'm going to input plural noun. So I have four lines of code that will have a variable name followed by a single equal sign followed by a call to the input function. Now, one of the things that you have to remember is, and, and we'll look at this a little bit, most of the time, Zybooks does not want you to put anything on the middle of your input statement. They want your input statements to be blank. And that's because it's easier for them to figure out what's going on in your running program. There are a few times, one of them is within this module, where you're going to have to add some text in, the in, in between the parentheses of the input statement. So just be aware of that. OK, so now I'm going to output. And I'm going to output whatever they tell me to. And in this case, in lab 1.9, they give you the string that they want you to substitute those values in for. Excuse me. Apologies. OK, lab 1.12. A variable like usernum can store a value like an integer. Extend the program as indicated. Output the user's input. I'll put the input squared and cubed and get a second user input into user num2 and I'll put the sum and the product. So this is one of those ones where you're going to have to make sure that the output is exactly like Zybook says it was. So, but here's the general flow. I'm going to input user num. I'm going to convert that to an integer. I'm going to square user num. I'm going to output the squared value of user num. I'm going to cube user num. I'm going to output the cube number. I'm going to input user num2. I'm going to convert user num2 to an integer. I'm going to sum user num and user num2. And I'm going to output that. And then I'm going to multiply user num and user num2. And I'm going to output that. And I'm going to end. One point two three. Um, write a program using integers, user num and x as input and output user num divided by x three times. So output means print. Use integers user num, it means use the input function. And then x, you're also going to want to use the input function. So I'm going to have a start. I'm going to input user num. I'm going to input x. I'm going to convert user num to integer. I'm going to convert x to integer. Then we're going to divide user num by x. And we're going to output it. And now we're going to divide 
div by x. Can't you cannot divide username by x three times. You have to divide the result of the previous calculation by x to get these answers right. And you're going to output div2 and then you're going to be done. Oh, sorry, you're going to output div3 and then you're going to be done. Okay, so now we're going to calculate weight. And again, we've got a couple of inputs. We're going to input age, weight, heart rate, and time. So you're going to have four inputs. And we're going to output this line here. Now, I haven't explained all the things that go on in this print statement. So this print statement looks a little weird. What you need to do for now is make sure that calories is the variable name that is used for the calculation because there's a calculation that they give you so, and it's got to be lowercase calories. So we're going to use the input function for each of the variables and a print function to output it. That's the print function that's there. So we're going to input age, we're going to input weight, we're going to input heart rate, we're going to input time, we're going to do some conversions. And when everything's converted, we're going to calculate the calories. And then we're going to output the calories, which is that statement up there. And then we're going to end. I think this is the last one. We're going to prompt the user to input an integer between 32 and 126, a float, a character, and a string, storing each in a separate variable, and output those four values on a string line separated by a space. So, four inputs. And remember when I was telling you about that end equal quote space quote? That's what you have to do for this for, for part of prompt one. Prompt um, two means you're going to output everything in reverse. That's okay. And then the third part is you're going to extend to convert the integer to a character by using the care function and output that character. So we have our normal start. We're going to input user int. We're going to input user float. We're going to input user care. We're going to input user string. Then we're going to output in the order. We're going to output user int, user float, user care, user string. We're going to output in the reverse order, user stir, user care, user float, user int. Now, these output are a little deceiving here because you cannot output a string and a float that hasn't been converted. So you have to make sure you're converting everything to strings that needs to be converted to a string. And then you're going to convert user into a character using the care function. You're going to output the character and then you're going to be done. And by the way, down here there's a little reference to the care function. So those are the labs. I know this was a lot of information. Does anybody have any questions? either about the labs, the work that has to be done, things that are going on in the class. I, I do. Is it okay if I talk? Absolutely, Jenny. You go right ahead and talk. Okay. Um, so it's nothing to do with the slides, but I'm a little confused with the grading. I completed Chapter 1 except for this lab right here. I was going to work on it tomorrow. Okay. Um, and so I have the grade for 1-3, but mm -hmm. 1-4, Four isn't graded. Is there anything I need to do, or is it automatically just sent to the to the instructor? So what 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 happens with the lab is we grade the labs. They don't get auto graded. So the lab the labs will show you how much you got right or how much you got wrong. They don't show up automatically in Brightspace. Okay. We get a report. Okay. So, so there's 
on the right hand side of Zybooks, and I apologize, it's, this is the very first time I'm ever working with Zybooks, and I'm a geoscience major. Still don't nothing, know why. You have nothing to apologize for. But um, it says submit it, and I can't remember. I'm not in that. I'm not in Zybooks, but it says submit mm -hmm. to to something. Is that what I'm supposed to do? When your lab is, when you think your lab is complete and it is ready, then you hit submit, and that's when it will get all. all whether that's what happens at that point is Zybooks goes and takes your scripts and runs it against different inputs. No, I'm sorry. Um, when you're outside of the chapters, so when you're in the main um, book where it shows all the chapters, and then on the right-hand side it shows activities, and it will show um, your, basically your work and everything in, in three separate tabs, and it will show it's like activity, subscription, and I can't remember what the other one is. But it says something along the lines of submit to what Dreamcatcher, I think it, it is. Okay. That is, Dreamcatcher is a tool that you can use to help you with any of the coding problems, and there is also something called Sense. Okay. They well, but I think Sense is used for the projects, and Dreamcatcher is used in Zybook. So it's not about submitting the grade. It's okay. about um, getting help if you need help. Okay. That makes sense. All right. Thank you. So technically, after I'm done with th this lab tomorrow, um, I don't need to do anything as far as submitting. Everything is being directly sent to my instructor. That's correct. The activities get okay. auto-populated. OK. And when you have submitted, when you see a percentage in your in your view, you'll if you open like module one, you'll see a percentage of things. Okay. When you see that percentage, that yeah. means it's been graded, basically. Or okay, graded. perfect. That looks as calculated. Thank but you so much. That clarifies so much. This is a completely different system than what I'm used to with other classes, and I was very confused. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm glad that we got that cleared up. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Anybody have any other questions? What labs are we mandated to do? We are mandated to do any lab that does not have the word optional after it. So all of these labs that are in this that I just went over are have to be done as part of your lab grade for week one. So any other questions? Going once, going twice. Oh, sorry. Labs show 100% complete, but I have no grade in bright space. That's okay, Cami. The instructors have to move the grades from Zybo to bright space for the labs. So it's not something that's going to be auto. It's not going to show up. Uh, Okay, if anybody does, I'll do it one more time. If there are any other questions, please put them well. So do we have to do labs with no option? Yes, you have to do the labs that do not have the word optional after them. Um, the challenges are not required. The challenges are there to help you understand the material better. But they are not part of your grade that you will never see a challenge as part of the grade. It can give you a score, but that score never gets into bright space. Even if it scores you, that score does not get to, into bright space. There's no place for me to manually move it to. There's nothing that is moved, there, and Zybooks doesn't do it. That is, the challenges are not, are not part of your, uh, your grade. Okay, going once, going twice. 
I'm going to stop the recording and stop sharing. And you guys have a great week. This should be up on my YouTube channel tomorrow, um, along with the links to all of the scripts and more scripts that we talked about. And I will see whoever wants to show up on Thursday night. Thank you. You're welcome.